Hello friends, I am Pastor Robert Adner and I serve Lutheran Church of the Cross in Muncie, Indiana and Grace Village, the Lutheran Episcopal Presbyterian Campus Ministry at Ball State University. Good to be with you here today. As you can tell, a little bit of a change of scenery, but we are in the sanctuary at Lutheran Church of the Cross. So I apologize if there's a slight echo. And today we are talking about the season of Lent. I know I'm a couple weeks late, but uh, as I like to do, uh, for those of you who may not have grown up in a liturgical tradition like myself, or unchurched like myself, uh, I like to explain some of these holy days that we observe that maybe aren't as popular for being hallmark holidays or big gift giving holidays, but I also like to discuss these seasons that we observe because the church uh, again, if you're liturgical, uh, observes everything in seasons every year. And so it gives us a rhythm, a cycle of life as we walk through uh, Jesus's journey here on earth and as we uh, learn about um, the many texts. Again, it follows what we call the Revised Common Lectionary. And so we're on a three-year cycle, year A, B, and C. And year A, we read through Matthew's Gospel. Year B, we read through Mark's Gospel. And year C, we read through Luke's Gospel. And John's Gospel is sprinkled throughout all of those. And then, in those periods of time, as it correlates with the other texts, we also work our way through most of Paul's letters and the epistles, and we get an Old Testament reading and a psalm every Sunday. That's how the lectionary works. But all those readings are based on what season we are in, whether we're in Lent or Easter or Pentecost or uh, Epiphany or Christmas or Advent, all of these different seasons are based on how that's laid out. And so these seasons in the church have been around for a long, long, long time. And so one of them that's been around a long time is the season of Lent. So let's talk about Lent. Um, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, and you may remember a few weeks ago, I did a video about Ash Wednesday and its origins and purpose, and Lent lasts roughly six weeks, or roughly 40 days. Now, those of you who start doing the math between Ash Wednesday and Easter, you realize there's more than 40 days there, but 40 days excluding the six Sundays that are in there. So Lent runs that span from Ash Wednesday right up until Holy Saturday, the night before Easter or, or Resurrection Sunday. So the purpose for the season of Lent is this idea that Lent prepares us for Easter. Lent prepares us to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord because in Good Friday, uh, you know, which is the Friday before Easter, we observe the crucifixion of Jesus. And so through the season of Lent, we, we think about um, the sins of old that led to the crucifixion of Jesus, but also our sins that Jesus took on when he went to the cross that fateful day 2,000 years ago. So Lent is a time of prayer. The time, it's, I, I kind of... It's almost like I would compare it to those of you outside the liturgical world. You could almost view Lent as like a season of revival, okay? So in the non-liturgical world, in the charismatic world, they'll have these revivals. They may last two or three days. They may last a week, but it's this idea of returning to your faith. Not that you ever left it, left it, but returning to the discipline of your faith. And so we use Lent as this almost revival time and where we, we focus again on prayer and maybe where we've neglected in prayer over the last year. And we it's a time of repentance and penitence. We think of the ways that we have sinned against both God and neighbor so that we can turn from those ways. Um, it's also a time of charity to remember the ways in which maybe we have slipped from our charitable practices over the last year. And it's a time of self-denial to take this time to remove ourselves, to identify the things in our life that separate us from God and neighbor and to deny us of that, but also self-denial in this form of fasting, right? Fasting is a big thing throughout scripture. A lot of churches don't talk much about it anymore, but self-denial, not that you're <clears throat> removing yourself from anything particularly harmful, but maybe something that brings you joy so that you can understand maybe what it's like to not have access to that all the time. And you'll 
stand more in solidarity with your siblings in the faith who may not have access to these luxuries of life that you have. And so it's a pretty heavy season when we talk about these things. Now the word Lent itself comes from this old English word, which is Lenten, L-E-N-C-T-E-N, Lenten. And that word itself means the spring season. Well, when does Lent take place? It takes place leading up through the season of spring. It starts in late winter, runs up through spring. And so the word Lenten is believed to have originated by this idea of the lengthening of the days, right? So our days are getting longer right now. And so that's the word Lent itself has no real religious connotations in that the fact that the season of spring happens to coincide with the lengthening of days. It's called different things in different places. I just learned that today as I was doing some research on this. And so as you go to different places that may not be English speaking or, or you know, the, the holiday was in place before the English speaking church got there, um, it, it's called different things. And usually the words in those cultures and those places uh, reflect usually a word, something that usually alludes to the term, the number 40, which we're going to talk about more because remember Lent lasts 40 days, or uh, a word from their language that alludes to the idea of fasting because Lent is a season of fasting as well. So that's kind of neat. I, I would encourage you to check that out where, what this season is called in different places. It's the same idea. It just has a different name. The origin of Lent is pretty unclear, which I think is interesting because it just goes back so far. Um, it, it's predated by other fasting traditions. So we know that other uh, springtime fasting was done in other cultures and, and, you know, in some of these ideas, maybe in the Christian church, even before they decided to attach it to Easter. Um, but the prevailing theory, at least on the church's behalf, is that Lent was established at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. I should do a whole other video sometime on the Council of Nicaea, um, but this idea, the Council of Nicaea was these bishops from all the churches. Now, remember, this is the fourth century, right? So this is a long, long time ago. But these bishops from all the churches coming together to create a uh, uniform Orthodox belief. So our belief about the Trinity, our, our, our uh, the words that we affirm with the creeds, our, our, our canon of scripture, all these things came together at these different councils in early church history because the church wanted to be of one mind and of one belief because you can't be a universal holy Catholic church. And remember Catholic, lowercase c, universal, not to be confused with Roman Catholic, uppercase c. So how do we become one universal church unified in thought? If we don't bring these people together from these different areas to, to make sure that the teaching of the Christian faith was uniform. So prevailing theory is that the season of Lent was established at this Council of Nicaea where they were establishing so many other Orthodox, lowercase o, not to be confused with Eastern Orthodox or Greek, or Greek Orthodox Church, coming together to establish what these Orthodox beliefs of the church would be. So why is it 40 days, right? Why do we use this number 40? It's not like it appears anywhere in the Holy Scriptures. You can tell I'm being facetious there because 40 shows up everywhere in the Holy Scriptures. Namely, we think about uh, the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. And so we kind of compare the season of Lent to 40 days of self-denial, our, our 40 days in the wilderness. But Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. Elijah took 40 days to walk to Mount Horeb. Jonah gave the Ninevites a warning of 40 days before God would cast judgment on them if they didn't repent. The Israelites wandered through the desert for 40 years. So 40, 40, 40. It pops up everywhere, right? Uh, what are some traditions of Lent? And so uh, many of you, maybe if you grew up on church or outside of the liturgical church, you, you always... Remember that you knew somebody who gave something up for Lent, or you knew somebody who didn't eat meat on Fridays because it was Lent. And so that, that's a, a big thing early on, is that for the whole season of Lent, people would give up meat, period. No meat. 40 days. That would, now remember, Sundays don't count, so you could eat meat on Sundays, or if it was a high, if it was a feast day, 
a commemoration day, sometimes you can get away with eating meat. But by and large, for a large portion of the church's history, people didn't eat meat at all during Lent. And so then that kind of got laxed. And so then it just became, well, don't do any meat on Fridays. That tradition is primarily upheld by the Roman Catholic Church, but sometimes Lutherans and Episcopalians do it. Maybe even Presbyterians or Methodists, maybe. Um, so that's why our Catholic friends have awesome fish fries during the season of Lent on Friday, because they're not supposed to have meat or an animal that bleeds, so to speak, even though fish bleed. Um, I remember in my last church, we were near uh, Mercer County, Ohio, and Mercer County, Ohio is super duper Catholic. And there was uh, every little tiny town had a Catholic church, a bar, and maybe a Lutheran church. <laughs> That's just what they had. And so all of these little bars in Mercer County had these awesome fish fries. And I miss those fish fries <clears throat> on Fridays during the season of Lent. Uh, again, we talked about giving something up for the season of Lent. And I remember I student taught under a teacher and uh, she grew up Methodist. Her dad was a Methodist pastor. She says, oh, it's Lent again? Uh, I'll give up the same thing I gave up last year, which is skydiving and bungee, or skydiving and bungee jumping. And I was like, come on now. <laughs> you know? So if you're going to give something up for the season of Lent, it shouldn't be trivial, right? Um, again, you can, you can fast from, you can give up something that you think is a luxury, to help you stand in solidarity with our Christian siblings who, who don't have the same luxuries that we have, or you can give something up that separates you from either God or neighbor. And that, that could be any number of things, any number of vices in your life or any other sorts of things that you know probably aren't the best in your walk of faith and the way that you connect with God and the world around you. So, um, or another thing, people like to add something. They, they take on a Lenten discipline, like I'm going to get up and read a devotional every morning, or I'm going to watch Pastor Robert's devotional videos uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. That's a joke. Uh, or, um, you know, scripture reading, more time in prayer, et cetera, et cetera. People like to add a Lenten discipline, and that's cool too. Um, another fun tradition of Lent is that all, the word Alleluia is not used, and Lord, forgive me for saying it in this video. Uh, Alleluia uh, is, is a word of joy. And so during Lent, we don't really do joy. We're really trying to be penitent and repentant. And so we'll say all that joy for Easter Sunday and the Easter season. So sometimes people will bury the Alleluia. They'll put it in a box or a chest and hide it in the sanctuary. Um, I think my predecessor, Pastor Jim here, used to do that, which was fun for the kids. And so the A word doesn't get used. So from now on, you hear me saying the A word, I'm talking about that, not that. So, uh, and also another thing people will do is they will veil crosses or religious images in their sanctuaries and their churches or their homes. They'll put a black cloth or a purple cloth over them so that you don't focus on the joy of Easter and resurrection or what Jesus has because it's not time yet. We celebrate that at Easter, and then we celebrate the rest of the year until next Lent. But like right now, we got to be focusing on getting better, right? Um, last thing, uh, we're talking about purple. Lent is the season of purple. We've got purple pyramids. You can see uh, on the um, lectern there. Oh, you can see them here on the altar um, or pulpit, lectern, pulpit, take your pick. Um, Purple gets used there, it gets used on my vestments. I wear purple vestments, and I'll show you some of these up close here in just a second. And then uh, you can also see the purple uh, banner up there. And so purple, uh, why do we use purple? Uh, purple is a color of repentance, and purple also ties in to the royalty of Jesus, right? So purple back in the day was a color for royalty because it was a very expensive color to extract and make. And so this idea that when they called Jesus the king of the Jews, when they were mocking him and disrespecting him, they put a purple robe on him and they thought that that was funny. Well, purple is, in, in one way I heard it explained, purple is to remind us that we kind of, not kind of, we disrespect Jesus. When we sin, we disrespect Jesus and we insult Jesus. And so I know that's harsh and hard to hear. But it's like this idea of purple to remind us that we need to repent because we disrespect and insult the royalty of Jesus as well 
just like those Roman soldiers did 2,000 years ago. So interesting thoughts around that there. So uh, I know that uh, if you're from my church, most of you like hearing about the different stoles and why I've got them and where I got them. And uh, maybe those of you who aren't from the church will appreciate it as well. But uh, the first one here um, is this one was actually made by our very own Cheryl Hazlitt. Cheryl made this here to match the one that's on the pulpit there and the one that's on the altar here. So it's really nice to have this lovely matching set and I'm very thankful to have that. Um, also, so here's one I, I just found here at the church and I like it a lot. Um, this is uh, more in line with what would be a, a stole used in the Anglican tradition because see how short it is? You put this on a guy my size, it doesn't even hit my knees. But I love the pattern. It's got this beautiful pattern on it. It's got the IHS for Iesus, which was the first letter of Jesus' name in the Greek. You've got a lamb of God here. You've got grapes. Um, the IHS again. But I just think it's a beautiful little stole. And even though it's short on me and it looks like I'm wearing a scarf, I like it. I mean, they're all technically kind of scarves, right? I should explain altar vestments or, or vestments someday so that you understand why I wear what I wear, from my collar to my white robe, known as an old, to these colorful scarves that we call stoles. Um, this one here was my first purple one. Um, my previous church, Redeemer Lutheran up in Bryant, when I was ordained, they ordered me a set of stoles as a gift, and I chose this one. I just love... Uh, I've always been a fan of the Celtic cross, and I just love those gold Celtic crosses against that purple backdrop there. And then last but not least, this um, beautiful stole was a gift to me by my dear friend and seminary classmate, Pastor Christina Boschman, who serves in, oh, forgive me, Christina, you're in the Bay, San Jose, California. I'm pretty sure she's in San Jose. Um, but yeah, again, you see these imagery, this imagery of Jesus' crucifixion, three nails, crowns of thorns, things like that. So beautiful stole. Uh, really appreciate you got that for me. And I saw a priest pop up in a cheesy horror movie uh, about to do an exorcism, and he was wearing this very same stole. And I thought, well, isn't that fun? And then last but not least, uh, one thing, again, not a big Lenten tradition, but kind of is, but... Uh, the pectoral cross that I wear throughout the whole season of Lent is this uh, cross that's made of nails. It's decorative nails. It's not really made of nails, but it's the idea, again, to keep us focused on Jesus' crucifixion. So I wear this one throughout the whole season of Lent. So, hope you all have enjoyed this video. Hope you've learned a thing or two. Again, not a deep dive, but just a kind of a cursory glance at the season of Lent why we celebrate it, and what we keep in mind as we're celebrating. So, uh, I hope you all stay safe and take care. Oh, and I'd like to report, uh, I think I told you in the last video, I got my second COVID vaccination, which was uh, the Moderna vaccination, not the Pfizer. And thankfully, I, I know a lot of folks uh, who have had a hard time after their second vaccine, I have done just fine. So just know that. Don't let your fears of any side effects keep you from getting the vaccine. Go get it as soon as possible. Indiana just dropped to the age of 50, and now educators of all ages in Indiana can go get it. So please go get your vaccine as soon as you can so that we can gather in person again. We can have fellowship in person again, and what a joy that will be. So my friends, take care of yourselves and one another. And until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.